Hello, thank you, Chuck. Um, this is, I, I'm standing between you and lunch. You don't get any lunch until you learn about compilers. That's the rule. <laughs> um, so, um, and this is a talk, um, it is specifically about what we're going to do in Ember and what we're working on. Um, but the, I want to start by talking a little more generally about compilers. I think compilers have a reputation of being a little scary, being a little complex and intimidating. If you studied computing in a university, the compiler course might have had a reputation as being a scary one. If you didn't and you got your intro to the web in a more direct way, learning web programming probably didn't come up at all. Um, but part of my message today is that compilers don't have to be scary. Um, it's true that writing a great compiler from scratch uh, is a big job, but just knowing a lot about what they are, uh, what they can do, what they can't do, and what kind of important jobs that even a simple compiler can do is very powerful and you get a lot out of it. So, come on, slide, where are you going? Advance, please. Where's my button? Okay. So, what is a compiler? Um, so the word compiler was coined by Grace Hopper in about 1950, and um, by 1952 she had written the first one, and uh, she had to work very hard to convince people that it was even a good idea. Like, like many of the good ideas that we know in tech and otherwise, uh, they only seem like good ideas that are obvious in retrospect, and they take a ton of convincing to get people to change the way they see the world. Um, this is a diagram out of a paper that she wrote in 1952. Um, and I, I find it really interesting that she had to like label brain goes here <laughs> because she's really trying to explain the division of labor between the person and the computer and she was changing that division of labor in a very radical way that was hard to convey to people. Um, and, and she had to come up with a lot of concepts that we still recognize today that she had to just invent whole, from scratch. The idea that you would use your brain to read the API docs to write the source code that the, then let the computer combine the libraries with your code. We understand that, and, and that was all like, getting laid out at this point in time. So that's, that's like where the word begins and where the concept begins. So a compiler is a program, right? And when we know what a program is, uh, I want to focus on the fact that all programs have input and output, right? And we don't always think about them in these simple terms, especially when we're working on a web application. Um, you know, your Ember app is a program, so what is its input and output? Uh, well, I would, I would say an like, uh, Ember app starts with the input of a URL. That's what's going to tell it how to start. And from that point forward, it's going to handle a stream of events from the user. And those are all the input. And your output is HTML. Right? Um, I think that's a very solid understanding of what an Ember app does. And you can always look under the hood and see more detail at any of these layers. Like the HTML is really DOM done directly. But that's really just performance thing. And understanding the of HTML is a great way to think about an Ember app. So, in the, taking the general idea of a program here and remembering, because it's going to be important, that all programs have input and output, right? a compiler is just a program, but the thing that's kind of special and fun about it is that the input and output are programs, right? So it starts to get a bit recursive right away. And I think this is where some of the reputation of compilers being hard to think about comes from, but it's also why they're fun and, and powerful. Um, now, of course, if you wrote a compiler that could only take as input one very particular program, that would not be very useful. Right? What we really mean is any program in some language, which I'm just labeling language A here as our input language. And of course, we hope our output is in some consistent language as well. Right? So we're going to call that language B. So um, we've got these two different languages involved. Of course, there's a, another language missing from this slide, which is that the compiler is the program. So it's also written in a language. Right? <laughs> so there's really three languages here. And, um, this is a very expansive definition of what is a compiler, and I think it's the best definition, but people can disagree about how to use the words, and people will quibble and use a few different terms, so I'll throw those out so that um, you know what those words mean. So, firstly, a, a true compiler, or some people would just call this a compiler, it's a more narrow definition, is when the input language is a language that's easy for humans, and the output language is easier for machines, right? This is your, this is the, this is what definitely what Grace Hopper was writing, this is what a C compiler does or a Rust compiler. Um, I think this is usually what people think of when they think of compiler. It's the most kind of, it's the oldest and most base case, right? You can swap those and have a decompiler, and that's a thing people do too when they're analyzing an existing program or reverse engineering it. 
it's just it's really the same kind of thing, but just doing the languages in, in the opposite direction. A self-hosting compiler is when the input language and the language that the compiler is written on are actually close to, close to the same language, and uh, also called a bootstrapping compiler because it's a compiler that can compile itself. And a transpiler is when the input language and the output language are nearly the same. Right? And so all of these terms are a little bit fuzzy, a particularly transpiler, um, because the nearly the same is very weaselly, and it depends on your point of view. So, you know, is Babel a transpiler or a true compiler it comes down to whether you believe that ES 2019 JavaScript is the same language as ES 5 or 4 JavaScript, right? If you think those are the different languages, then it's basically a true compiler. If you think they're kind of the same, then it's a transpiler. And all of this argument is very uninteresting. But I, I'm doing it so we define the terms. <laughs> so that when you hear these terms, and, you, and you, you have a solid grounding in what people are talking about. So let's also talk about what compilers can and cannot do. Um, and this, this also relates to what they are, because that a, uh, to, to know what, what compi a compiler can't do, that helps you know, is this thing a compiler or not? So recall that our output program is a program, and all programs have input and output. So we could think about things this way. Uh, when we do this, the first thing to notice is that the compiler doesn't see the input, right? The compiler is going to emit as its own output our program in language B, and then that program is going to have to accept any old input you give it, and it could be every possible input, and the compiler doesn't know what those are in advance, and it can't possibly know. So the compiler doesn't have the information to run the program. You can't run this program until you've got the input, and you don't have the input, so the compiler cannot run the program. And so compiling is not evaluation. And that means the compiler can only know some things about the program. It can't know everything about the program. The things that it can know are, are things that we call static. Right? Static describes the facts that you can know about a program without running it. And dynamic describes the facts that you can't know until you run it. Right? These two words are very useful words that are very general, and so they get repurposed in programming to mean different concepts in different times. It's usually some flavor of the same idea, but there's different uses in different contexts. For this talk, this is what it means. Um, and I'll be careful to stick to that, though. Even I find myself rehearsing this using them in slightly different contexts. So they are slippery words that get used for lots of different things. All right, so our input, our input program is also a program. So it necessarily, I said all programs have an input and an output. So we can think about it this way, too. Um, and this brings us to an important idea about compilers, which is they're supposed to take a pr program in one language and give you a program in a new language, that means the same thing. Right? If it had a totally different meaning, the compiler, it's not really what a compiler is for. It's not what a compiler does. And so if you give them these two programs the same input, they should get the same output. Right? So we say that the compiler preserves the semantics of the input language and just translates those same semantics into the output language. Right? And this, is a, this slide is a really key idea of when thinking about compilers and languages because um, if you don't preserve those semantics, you're not really doing the thing that I describe as a compiler. And there's, there's a key insight here that I want you to take away, which is thinking about, always thinking about your programs in these terms. And, and this comes up not just for compilers and languages, but really any time you're trying to design an API, which is it's a kind of language design in the small. Right? A lot of the same... I, the bigger or harder your problem is as you're designing an API, the more it looks like designing a language. So the same skills apply and these same concerns come in, even when you're making an API that's just, uh, and I don't just mean like a REST API, I mean like any interface in your application that other programmers are going to use. Um, so to illustrate, I want to point out that this arrow is often unimplemented, right? Taking language, the input program, and just somehow running it to get an output might not actually be implemented. What do I mean by that? Well, in kind of an old school C program, you would write a program in C. You can't run that program. You have to compile it to an executable and then run that to get the output. Right? So we say that the direct link there from the program, the input of program to the output, is not really implemented. Your Ember app works the same way because you write files like app router.js and temp, my template.hbs and all of those things 
And the web browser doesn't run those things directly, right? It doesn't know how. It, it's going to run files that get compiled through Ember CLI into a folder called dist, which is going to have a bunch of, it's going to have HTML and JavaScript and stuff. And that's the stuff the browser knows how to run. So you can't actually run your input program directly. But just because that arrow is unimplemented doesn't make it not important. And to explain why, this subset of the diagram kind of shows us how it really works, right? We know that to get from an input to an output, you would have to take your app, compile it, get that compiled output, run that, and then have an output. But this is a complicated way to think about the meaning of your program, right? It means that to, when you're trying to work in your Ember app, you can't just think in the app. You have to understand what the, com you're thinking in terms of what the compiler will do with, it, do with it and what it will mean in the end. And so the semantics of your program, the meaning of your program, is very tied in with, it's very entangled with the implementation, right? It's much nicer if we could think about our program this way. We want to be able to think in the language we're working in. We want to think in Ember and not have to worry about how it's implemented. And we keep keeping a separation between the implementation and the interface. So conceptually, an Ember app absolutely does have an output. Right? If the Ember app has a clear meaning, we should know what the right output would be, right? independent of how you get there. So for the purpose of this talk, I want to call, forgetting to do this, I'm going to call it the implementer's trap. I think it is a common thing that happens, and I'm calling it the implementer's trap because the people who know the most about how it really works are the ones who are most danger of, of falling into this trap, which is why it's kind of like an advanced level boss in programming. Um, because the more you know about how it works, you can actually skip ahead and just say like, well, I know this will do that, we'll do that, we'll do that, we'll do that, so therefore that's what it means. Right? Um, but that's not the same as knowing the abstract semantics of what the interface is supposed to mean. Um, it causes two problems. One is that it makes, things, makes life harder for human readers because they now, to keep up with you, have to know all those steps. Uh, and it makes life harder for, for um, it makes life harder when you're trying to improve your compiler because now the semantics of your language are defined by the compiler and it's implementation defined. And so it's not clear what is safe to change in your compiler, change and improve, without changing the semantics of your language. Right. If you contrast that with having a specified standard for a language, like JavaScript has the ECMA spec, right? browsers and Node can change the way they implement JavaScript and then double check, do we still follow the standard? Right. And that's why a standard is good. And the same applies to your own APIs and to language design. And uh, like an Ember app should have mean, mean a standard thing and let us be free to change the implementation. So do we succeed in having clear abstract semantics in Ember? Overwhelmingly, yes, uh, because we follow good web specs for all the JavaScript, all the HTML. We follow standards. Those standards are codified independent of their implementations. Um, and Ember's own APIs are designed very carefully to separate interface and implementation. But there is an area where we need, we need improvement, and that area is modules. So Ember and the Ember community were very early adopters of module syntax in JavaScript imports and exports and all that stuff. Um, being very early adopters means that all of our, the vast majority of the code in Ember apps today is written in modules, and that turns out to be very, very good for us and for the rest of this talk, the subject of it. Um, Ember people helped write the standard even, um, but we haven't really gotten all the way over the line of fully adopting the semantics. And so there's a, this is a gap where we don't actually have, there's no spec we follow exactly, and so we end up being implementation defined and having, an ex having some instances of this implementer's trap. So I'm going to show quick first a bug uh, that exists in Ember CLI even today. This is an example of two modules using each other. Um, can anybody tell me what this is supposed to do by the spec? It's supposed, it's supposed to blow up. It's not supposed to work. This isn't valid JavaScript. Uh, does anybody know what it does in Ember CLI? It, it works. <laughs> um, it, it's a, so it's a subtle thing, and, but it turns out it's real. I, know, I knew about this because um, you know, having implemented it, the more strict version that we're about to talk about, I found add-ons that do this, and so I'm sure if add-ons do this, apps do this. It's a sm this is a small thing. So the, the right way to say this would be either this, which is to get a named export out of the module, 
or this, which is to grab the whole module as an actual module object. Both of those work. The first one actually doesn't in JavaScript. Um, so this, this, is, this case is not a hard case. This is a bug fix where we just have to get a little closer to the standards. Um, and it means when we do the bug fix, it will cause things that used to work to not work, and it will be a breaking thing to figure out. But there's a, there's a bigger issue, which is less about following the letter of the spec and more about following the spirit of the spec. So these are all common imports you might have in a number app, and you've probably all seen all, every, every one of these. Well, I guess Glimmer component is new enough. Maybe you didn't do it yet. But um, these are all pretty, like, you could see these in a number app and know what the intention is. But what do they really mean? What, what, what do they mean is kind of a hard question to answer. Um, in the JavaScript spec, in XMS spec, this part that's highlighted in green in each of these is called the module specifier. And the good news is that ECMA doesn't tell you what it's supposed to mean. So we're not violating the spec. Um, it, it's left up to the diff different JavaScript environments to implement. So like browsers and Node are allowed to come up with their own answers here. And so like basically in, in the web browser context, for example, what this means is not up to JavaScript the language. It's up to like the web platform committees, like what W8, the what working group and not the um, ETC39, right? It's like the split between JavaScript, the language, and the web browser, the runtime. Um, and like web browsers are moving along and coming up with their own answers for this. Node has its own answer for this. Uh, so there's different competing standards for what it means. Um, which standard we, did we pick? Well, none. Uh, ours is very implementation defined. Uh, the, and there's, an, and there's a, not just being implementation defined, but another problem with it I want to illustrate by looking closely at how module syntax is designed. So this thing is not allowed, this kind of a pattern. Right? It's not allowed because the module specifier has to be a string literal. It can't have anything dynamic in it. The intention is that imports should be static. This is the same use of meaning of static I said before. You want to be able to know what it means before you run the program. And with a pattern like this, you can't, you can't always know what it means without running the program. Maybe to know user locale, you have to run the program, get the input, all those things. Right? Another example, this is not valid JavaScript. Why is this not valid JavaScript? Same reason, right? To, to know whether or not we depend on some library, you have to run the program. It's not static, it's dynamic. Right? Here's another example. When you have this kind of code, if you run app.js, what, will, what output will you get? Right? Anybody know? That's right, how comes first. Uh, because all your import statements are always run as if they were the first thing. You can write them interleave with the code, but they don't really live there. They're not really dynamic. And this is the same reason as the others. It's because if they were allowed to go any old time, to know the timing of the modules, you'd have to run the code. It would become dynamic and not static. Right? So the, the bottom line is that everything about import is designed to be static. And our, and our, but our semantics are not static. So this is why I say we don't violate the letter of the law, but we violate the spirit of it. Um, when you want to be dynamic, there is dynamic import, which is import with parentheses, which is a newer feature you probably haven't used it or maybe not, haven't seen yet. Um, I point this out because it is something that I will refer to later. Um, it is a great feature, but it's different than the, the static case. Um, and it can do all of the things that I just described are not allowed with the static import. All of them work with dynamic import. The ordering will happen in the order that you see it in the code. It can be inside of a conditional. It can have a very dynamic argument, all those things. So. That was the statement of the problem. Moving on to the statement of the solution. Um, I said, firstly, that part of the problem is we don't, have a, we don't have a spec, we don't have a standard. So the first part of the solution is making a standard. And the first step of that is this RFC number 507, Ember RFC, called V2 add-on format that I made. Um, this creates a new standard for what constitutes an em a package, an em Ember package. And that means add-ons, but also apps. And a lot of the emphasis is on add-ons because that's the harder part of the system. Mostly just because we value so much keeping the community using shared solutions, uh, having shared code, and that creates an extra tension around code that comes across organizational boundaries, whether that's a, a, a different team in your company that you don't necessarily have direct control over or a different 
company entirely or some, somebody out on the web. When you're crossing package boundaries, there's an organizational difference. And so you have, there's a bit more careful coordination needed at that boundary than, than the work within one application. So that's why a lot of the emphasis has been on, on add-ons. Apps are just as important, of course, and you spend a lot of time in apps, um, but it's, you don't have to think about them as packages as much. Basically, less of, this, less of this, the problems come up, and they're easier to just, it's easier to solve a problem by just cha making a change in your app and not having to change the universe of packages. So add-ons are, get emphasized a lot in here, but I'm just trying to say that this is a standard for how all Ember code should be. So call it V2, V2 packages. The standard has a lot in it. It's a pretty big RFC. Even though I tried to scope it down, it doesn't do all the things it needs to do yet. Um, among the things it does, though, is following into our story so far, it creates a static, well-defined semantics for what those module specifiers should mean, and, it, and as well as defining things like what kind of code goes in, goes, is allowed to be in an Ember, Ember package. Like, you can't have arbit arbitrary, weird features. It needs to be like standard JavaScript. You can. You can author still in any kind of, uh, any language, any unstable JavaScript features you want, but before it gets published to, to, to end users, it needs to be compiled down to very standard JavaScript. That kind of a thing is what this has. And it has a lot, there's a lot more to it. There's a, I can't possibly go into all the detail in the time remaining. But so let's say now, okay, great, we have a spec. That's, a, that's one of the things we're missing. How do we, how does that help us now? Because none of our existing code follows the spec. So that's where Embroider comes in, which is the project I started to begin implementing a new build system for Ember, and we've got a lot of momentum behind it already. Um, thanks to the 18 other contributors we already have and the many, many commits. Um, so Embroider is a multi-stage compiler, and I, didn't, I haven't included that one yet in my list of compiler words, so I'll just say that it's, it is kind of what it sounds like. A multi-stage compiler is when you, you break the work into different pieces so that you can go from, not just all the way from language A to language B in one step, but you take intermediate steps along the way. This is a very powerful pattern that we see again and again in computing. As an illustrative example, this is the Rust compiler stages, and this won't be on the test, but I wanted to... <laughs> I wanted to use it as an example of actually two things that do apply to the case of Embroider as well. One of them is that, so Rust compiles, Rust is the language that you would write to eight, uh, high order intermediate representation, then to medium intermediate representation, then to LLVM intermediate representation, which stands for low level virtual machine. And then, so those first three stages are Rust specific. LLVM IR is a standard that it goes way beyond Rust. And Basically, most compilers out there today that are modern compilers that are trying to compile binaries end up targeting LLVM IR because it's good at going the rest of the way. You can take your LLVM IR, you run it through the LLVM program, and you get out binary code for whatever processor you want. And LLVM knows about all those processors. So you don't have to do all that step. Right? So there's two key ideas in here. The first is by having multiple different languages along the way, you m give the later stages much more power because you can simplify the world that they're going to see. Right? You can deal with, you could deal with a lot of the niceties that a human-oriented language like Rust wants. Those get compiled away in the first stage into a stripped-down version of the language that is much more suitable for dealing with in a, in a computer. Right? And then that lets the next stage do even more simplification and reduction which flattens things out enough and simplifies them enough that very powerful global optimizations become possible in the later stages. Things that would be very hard to see globally if you were dealing with the full richness of the original language. So that's the first lesson, is that having intermediate stops along the way makes your compiler more powerful. And the second lesson is, you don't have to write a compiler that goes all the way to the final language you want to get to. It's actually a really good idea to target a well-documented, well-supported, shared solution language that can then be run through standard tools to get you to your final destination. And so in the Embroider architecture, we have three stages, and they embody these same ideas. So the first stage, which is implemented as Embroider Compat for compatibility, it takes the Ember apps and Ember add-ons that you have now as its input, and its output language is a collection of V2 Ember packages. This is that new spec that's described in the RFC. Right. And so at, at that stage, we are translating from the wild and woolly universe of things that can happen today, which 
again, are, they're extremely powerful, but that's actually part of the problem, right? They're, they can do almost anything. And we want to get to a more constrained and static and specified set of things they can do. So that's the kind of work that happens there. And then the next stage is going to take all of those Ember packages that are now basically, the, the nice thing about the second stage is it gets to live in the future, right? It, it's as if you had authored all of this code in the nice V2 format. And so we can write the core stage uh, without worrying about a lot of the backward compatibility concerns. It's not that we can do that perfectly. Some things sneak in at the core stage. But a lot of the difficulty that you would have had trying to implement core by itself goes away because we'd have already, we've already moved ourselves into the future by the time core sees the code. And so core is going to output plain old JavaScript and CSS and HTML. And I mean, and I mean plain in the sense that after that point, you don't need to know about Ember, anything Ember specific. So core knows what a route is. It knows what an engine is. It knows about fast food. It knows about components. It knows about templates. Its output language doesn't need to know that stuff. It just needs to follow the web standards of JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. Right? And this is equivalent to our LLVM IR stage. Right? This is where we've gotten down to a standard thing. It isn't optimized to run in every browser the way we want it to run. It is still a bundle of thousands of loose files. Uh, not bundled. It's not bundled. It's a bunch of loose files that refer to each other, but through standard ways, whether that's HTML with a script tag type module pointing at a JavaScript module, or a JavaScript module importing another JavaScript module statically, or a module importing another module dynamically. Those are all the kind of relationships that we can express in standard ways that allow us to express the semantics of our Ember app in a standard language. And then the final stage can be a non-Ember specific JavaScript general kind of tool that does the optimization and bundling to get us to the actual code that's optimized for browsers. So to give a few examples of what goes on in these stages. In stage one, um, we're running any add-ons tend to, many add-ons do very powerful custom things by having custom code that runs within, inside of Broccoli to generate their source code. And a way to think about this is that um, the most, the most fundamental API to know what is, if you have an add-on and you say like, okay, add-on, what, what are you, what have you got for me? The only real interface is to call the add-on as a program and run it, and it gives you back its source code. Right? So that's a very dynamic thing. This is where I mess up and use the word dynamic differently than I said it was going to be. This is a slightly different kind of dynamism because it's true that that stuff doesn't need to boot the Ember app. There's code that runs during the build where you're taking some of your input language and running some of the code during compile time because some of the code is designed to run during compile time. It doesn't need to boot the Ember app. It doesn't need that input. So it isn't the same kind of dynamic, but it is a, it's still the need to run arbitrary code to know what's going on. It is code that's designed to run during the build, so it's possible to run during the build. But it means you still have to run the arbitrary code, which makes life harder for a lot of things. For example, for your IDE or editor to know where files come from to follow their definitions, it can't easily, it can't know where they come from without going and knowing a lot about how to run all those very Ember specific steps. So it is, it's a kind of dynamism that we also don't want, but it's not the same exact dynamism I mentioned before. Um, it, it is an important kind of dynamism, and we, we, we want to much reduce it, but allow it in very scoped ways. So I'm not going to go into detail in this talk on how the new spec allows compile time dynamism, but it does through a macro system. So we run all that custom broccoli stuff here in stage one, if there is any. Then we move all the files around so that their actual paths on disk match what you would import. Today, there's a lot of different conventions for how Ember add-ons files actually become paths that you would import with a module specifier. Here we do the moving around so they actually match. We recapture modules that try to escape their package. And this has been like an ongoing battle because I keep finding new ways that they do it. There's like <laughs> at least five. Uh, and what I mean by escape their package is you install a certain package from NPM. Like, well, actually an example is that is in every Ember app out of the box is you install Ember QUnit, but then you can import things from QUnit. Right? And that's convenient. However, it's confusing, right? Like, how did you get QUnit? If you look at that import, you would assume that you're going to get from QUnit. And ultimately, you do, but through a very convoluted route. And that's probably one of the least 
bad examples because it at least con it's, it's conceptually clear at least that you're getting to your unit, even though the implementation is very hidden. Um, and there's worse examples of things that just. <laughs> it, 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 this is a question of manners. It is always bad manners to have your package pretend to be somebody else's package. Let's put it that way. Uh, in this stage, we're also applying custom any custom pre-processing to add-ons and things like that. Today, every add-on could use its own dialect of JavaScript with its own custom preprocessors, Babel plugins. It can use its own dialect of templates with its own template preprocessors. It can use custom template transforms. All those things are totally allowed in add-ons, and they're good and they're powerful. Um, the problem is that it means you have uh, you actually have the original Babel problem of a thousand different languages that don't all mean exactly the same thing. Um, I mean that not in Babel, the French Bible, but literally like the Bible story, right? Um, the, uh, and it, it's, it, it has negative implications just because it makes things more complicated and it makes it harder to have one global view of the whole program uh, that understands it in one language. So we get, we get rid of that by doing all the custom stuff for each add-on first here in stage one so that by the time we get to the nice standard V2 packages, they are in a standard language. And we also do a few things like generate some synthesized packages that uh, basically become holding, holding pens for the legacy behaviors that we know we need to keep around, but that don't really fit into this package world. An example of that is how add-ons can have a thing called vendor assets, and the vendor assets are supposed to kind of smash each other. If two add-ons try to provide the same file, they're actually supposed to compete, right? And so if everybody's not allowed to escape their package anymore, it, those two ideas don't really match up. So we do things like generate a special package just to, just to hold all that stuff. And this is, you know, this is, this is possible because we're going to do this you know, for your, your specific Ember app based on all the universe of add-ons you have. And there's always many add-ons, by the way. Whether or not you think you use a lot of add-ons, even a stock Ember app tends to have a lot of add-ons. And um, you're gonna, we're going to look at that whole set, run all their custom stuff, find what they need, and gather it together into a, very, into a made just special for you like synthesized vendor package. But the synthesized vendor package follows the, the V2 spec very literally. So now core doesn't need to know anything about all that stuff. And which takes us to core, stage two. So core um, is really where we get to implement Ember's semantics. Right? Um, and so we want to express what an Ember app is. We want to get it to just say that in JavaScript. Right? And you you know, there's, there's definitely an argument that people make that says, well, maybe that's like how you should have written your Ember app in the first place. Why didn't you just say it in JavaScript? It turns out it could be very, very verbose, right? Like, we actually get a lot of benefit from having convention over configuration, standards. Um, for, for example, being able to, like, make a new route by just making a new route and ha not having to go and, like, patch it into multiple different places, right? So it's nice to have smart build tools that can know your conventions and, and synthesize code for you. And that's the kind of thing that happens in stage two. So we're going we're gonna to actually write JavaScript files that re represent the entry points to the app that will have actual import statements to say, these are the things we need to boot the app, and this is the code that boots it. Right? We basically write that code. And we're going to do things like resolve the components and helpers that you're, are being used in each of your templates. We're actually going like, to see the template, see that you call the particular component, figure out which one that really is at build time, and express it as an import statement on that template once that template's compiled. Right? That is a hard thing to do today without all of the earlier stages, but it's easy to do in, relatively easy to do in Inverter because stage one already took out so much of the variability in terms of where could that component be coming from. Now there's actually a much smaller set of places it could be coming from. It's a very static set of places. So we can, that, this is an example of where stage two is powerful because stage one did so much of the, of the setup for it. And so by doing this, we actually establish a complete dependency graph from each, uh, from, you know, from the entry point JavaScript. The entry point JavaScript probably depends on, say, application.hps. Application.hps might call some component, so it'll actually import that component, which might use a helper, so it'll import that helper. And so that whole graph ends up becoming visible in purely JavaScript terms with imports and link script tags and things like that. Um, and where there are other more complex kinds of dependency, like for example, um, lazy engines, which is code that you, can, you might need sometime but don't need right away, we can express that in standard JavaScript too using dynamic import. And the same goes for being able to split code on route boundaries and things like that. Right. And so that takes us to stage three, which is really just about optimizing because 
An interesting thing about the stage two output is that in theory it should already kind of run. Right? If you imagine that you had a web browser that was very capable, doesn't need any translation, understands module loading, um, can be told how to do module loading following the node algorithm and all that, it would run already at stage two. And that's kind of a powerful idea because it means we have a fully, we have a built app that follows standards, but it's not going to run like fast because it's still maybe 10,000 files, right? And none of them have been pre-optimized or anything like that. So the, the final stage becomes really more about optimization than correctness, which is pretty nice. Um, we're able to delegate to standard JavaScript build tools. The implementation we have today uses Webpack. Um, you can imagine putting roll up here, you can imagine putting parcel here, or something future that isn't written yet. And the fact that we're free to adopt the best thing that comes out based off the investment of the whole JavaScript universe is one of the powerful ideas here. And we're trying hard to defend that future flexibility by not leaning very hard on anything specific to the implementation of Webpack. Um, Webpack is a good choice right now, particularly because, because it is so, so widely used, um, areas where there is lack of a standard, it just has become de facto standards for things. And so every library, libraries out there that don't work well in Webpack tend to have already gotten that issue filed, right? So it helps with intercompatibility. Um, and we give this tool total freedom to decide how the entire module graph should be sliced and diced for, for optimized delivery. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, today every Ember app has this kind of very rigid app.js, vendor.js, app CSS, vendor CSS, unless you, and then like some engine specific ones if you do that, um, unless you go really out of your way to try to, and to try to hand customize what file, what ultimate file your code is going to go into. Um, with embroidered architecture, the philosophy is that you really don't want to have to hand manage any of those decisions. And it's really up to the optimizing final stage to decide how many bundles of JavaScript there should be, what they should be named, how they should relate to each other. It's really just an optimization game because there's differing good solutions. Like you can optimize for not overfetching code that you don't need. You can optimize for making the fewest network requests. You, you want to turn the knob somewhere in the middle probably to get the best performance. And so it ends up being a rich, complex, complex question where we don't want to overconstrain it. We want to give as much flexibility as possible. And, and examples of the kind of things that would work are, um, that already work today if you try out Embroider, is that you know, we do have route-based code splitting. You can make it so that you can designate a route that is not going to load until you need it. And when we do that, um, because we've allowed the final stage to optimize everything, it will actually notice that if maybe you've got two different lazy routes, but maybe they both use a common library, it could put that common library embedded inside of two different JavaScript files and you get two copies of it and have more JavaScript. Or maybe it'll notice it should really make a third file that is the common stuff so you get better cacheability. Right? That just becomes an optimization decision. And what's nice is like, we haven't committed to any particular strategy. We have full, total flexibility to get the best strategy out there. And the best strategy is going to change as the web changes, as networks change, as browsers change. <coughs> HTTP2 is, power, is like changes the, the changes things some, not as much as people think it will. There's a lot of give and take. So the benefits at the end of this whole architecture are we have complete pull-based builds. This really checks off the checkbox that people tend to call tree shaking. I, I prefer not to use the term because tree shaking implies that you're going to pull everything in first and then figure out how to take out the things you didn't really need. This is about never even pulling the things you didn't need in the first place. Right? Nothing gets into the build unless it's pulled on. So any, every unused helper in, your, in every add-on that you use or your app just won't do anything. It won't be in your app. Every unused component won't be in there. Um, the amount of things that we can do this for uh, is going to go up over time as we continue to evolve Ember itself to make things more static. Like for example, right now, we don't take out unused services because we can't tell. But with a little more work on Ember API side, we'll get to the point where we can tell. Right? That kind of thing. Same goes for like Ember data models. Today, we don't upfront shake out unused Ember data models because it's too dynamic. But as this, this now creates the incentive for us to do the work in the APIs to make those things need more static. The builds. Uh, it, this takes us toward faster builds. Even with the full compatibility layer, Embroider is competitive with existing builds. It shouldn't be slower. It should be within the same ballpark. Um, on some cases, it's already faster. I'm not going to try to share hard numbers because it depends so much on your app, and we're evolving the code so fast that it's hard to be right. 
Um, but in general, it's not any slower already with full compatibility on. And as we move the ecosystem forward, as more add-ons can eventually ship natively in V2 format, there's a ton less work to do for them. They're very static. And so the builds get way faster the more add-ons ship natively in V2. Now, if you're an add-on out there and your best of race family ship is E2, please don't yet. We need to stabilize the RFC to say exactly what it is. But when we do, that's going to let us start moving in that direction. Um, you get the other, another benefit. You get to use dynamic import anywhere for arbitrary code splitting and lazy loading. This is a very powerful primitive. I think a lot of Ember apps, because we'll be able to follow conventions, won't need to do this because they can just do the like, conventional things like using lazy engines or asking Embroider to split their code at route boundaries and letting it take care of this. But to know that it's there is very powerful. And um, as, as I mentioned, there's automated route aware code splitting that uses the dynamic import feature for you. And also just importing anything directly from NPM statically or dynamically. Today, you can do this for third party dependencies using Ember auto import, which I also made. And that's not a coincidence, because it's really a polyfill for parts of Embroider. But what Ember auto import can't do is do that kind of thing for Ember code, either parts of your app itself or parts of add-ons. And the reason it can't is because it, it needs this global visibility that Embroider has. And so um, auto import is great for all third party stuff that's non Ember code. Um, but it, so it's basically a polyfill for that piece of Embroider. Embroider gives you the full thing. And under Embroider, it doesn't do anything because Embroider natively, part of the spec for these packages is that they can just import anything from NPM. That's, that's literally the meaning of import statements there. So the, the takeaway is none of these by itself is a giant, amazing feature in 2019. But what is amazing is that an app that was started years ago, when these were not even on people's minds, right, gets these features. No big rewrite. Right? So the, the final lesson is let's keep moving forward as a community. And I love the way we do that. No big app rewrites. Bring all the latest, greatest features to the apps we have, even though there was no way to predict them. Right? And that's a really powerful thing that I think our community should be proud of. So that is it. Thank you.